Okay, so I'll do just a, a brief sponsor speech. Um, thanks to Assurity for, for sponsoring this. Um, for those of you that, that know me, I founded Claris in 2006, and I came down to Christchurch from contracting and consulting in Auckland, and I wanted to shake up the market here, particularly in professional services. I want to do something quite different. Um, so it, it took us a few years to find our niche, to be frank, and we realised that niche was agile. Um, and, and we really became quite good at Agile, but we're also around that we built a, a very strong BA practice and a strong testing practice because our focus was to try and improve how the industry worked. Um, I was approached by Garth Hamilton um, from the CEO of Assurity um, in 2011 and we continued discussions through 2012. And what I saw was a company that was going on the exact same journey as us, but had come from a slightly different path. So Assurity existed to try and improve how companies deliver software. And we saw an opportunity to be able to work together. And um, I liked the fact that these guys were in Auckland and Wellington. We were in Christchurch. There was all these things that dovetailed together very, very nicely. So um, their path was slightly different in that Assurity started out as a software testing company, but found very quickly that they were compressed at the end of a classic um, sort of project where, as a, as a tester, you're the bearer of bad news typically, where you're, you're typically telling a, a customer that you know, there are bugs in their software and they shouldn't go live. And what they wanted to do is be a bit more proactive by bringing that message further up the, the life cycle to be able to build in quality rather than just sort of tell people there's problems at the end. And so they were on this agile lean journey as well and, and we saw the opportunity to be able to work together and, and, and in essence go further. Or I think the, the classic saying for um, crossing the desert is if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. And so I saw the opportunity to go with others and make a real difference. So I guess our mission for, from Assurity is when we look at the New Zealand landscape, this, this is the most fantastic country in the world. I, I travel a fair bit now. I come back to New Zealand and I just adore this country. But we have some challenges and that we're a long way from markets. And if you look at some of our recent statistics, we work some of the longest hours, but we're the least productive. So our, 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 our contribution as a percentage of GDP is poor. And I personally am inspired by doing something about that. And if we're going to hit targets like the CDC announced, um, or Ben talked around this morning with this new plan around 20% in high tech work, then we're going to have to start to look at working about things smarter rather than just harder. So our focus is on improving the software industry and improving software outcomes. So uh, we, we feel very inspired and motivated to be able to help New Zealand do those sorts of things. So um, my job is to run education, which is kind of at the, the forefront. We get out there and we help clients learn these new ways of doing things, and we bring in the services that then help the, the people um, implement those things and actually go about improving so that it beds into their business and New Zealand businesses become more competitive. So look, that's all I want to say from Assurity. Um, thank you very much for sponsoring the stream. It's great to see the, the backing of Agile. Um, I think Claris first sponsored the Software Summit in 2007 and the, the momentum's going to continue on. Right, I want to talk um, about uh, a, a subject dear to my heart, and that is moving Agile beyond software. So um, I spent three and a half weeks in the States recently at the Agile 2013 summit, and it was quite mind-boggling how big things are becoming very, very quickly. As an example, um, about three or four years ago, if you put the word Scrum into a search engine for a job search engine like monster.com, you'd get about 60,000 hits. If you did it into hire.com last year, you're getting about 650,000. So it's gone, Agile has gone kaboom. The conference had 1,700 people at it for five days. It was a massive event. And one of the big trends that was, that was evident is that Agile is moving well beyond software. It's moving into how we do business. And that's what I want to talk about today. So here's a bit about me. Um, I've kind of talked a bit, but um, my, my claim to fame these days is that I became the world's first agility path and engagement manager, which basically means I can use Agile certified to be able to help businesses implement um, practices and use Agile for change. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So if you, if you look at business context and look at where we've come from um, and, and what's shaped our current context, I want to start with that first because it's an important platform for us to think around how do we think around management and how do we think around approaching problems. So this chap here, Frederick Taylor, 
broadly recognised as the grandfather of modern management. He wrote this book called Shop Management in 1902 or 1903. And Taylor had this cynical view that workers were lazy, in essence, and that people, uh, for those of you that have read management theory, there's theory X and theory Y, and theory X says that people are lazy and need managing and need to be told what to do and blah, blah, blah. So this guy kind of invented this concept, and his belief was that management's job is to force workers to be more productive, to try and get more out of them. And he had this belief that, that formed a management theory called Taylorism, that is basically, it's, it's known as reductionalism, where we take a problem, and if we can deconstruct that problem down into smaller parts, into tasks, and then we can allocate those tasks to people in the most optimal way, and then manage the people and force them along, then that will give us the most optimal possible outcome. And this has been our underlying management philosophy that's gone throughout the last century. So his work was followed by Henry Ford, who was known for saying, you know, I did, well, something about um, didn't, he just want workers to go fast and not to innovate or didn't want people with a brain, didn't want them to think. Um, James McKinsey, for, who was an accountant from McKinsey Corporation and the, the consultancy. Uh, Henry Gantt, who created the Gantt chart. Their thinking was exactly along these lines. And if you look at these types of problems that they were solving, that type of thinking worked. It was the right approach for that time. So reductionalism taught us this concept of plan to execute and then execute the plan. So there was this naive belief that back then, well, it wasn't naive back then, but it is now, that if you could just analyse everything, you could put it all on a plan, and then all the dummies just follow the plan, right? It's the McDonald's system. Make it so simple that everyone can just follow it. So the focus is on removing variability from the process. Variability is the enemy in that type of management. Um, and the, the focus is very much on economies of scale. We get efficiencies from lining it up and pumping it through on volume. It's very, very efficient for mass production, but there's a huge problem with this type of thinking and that it gives you very little ability to change when you're working with a, a market or a, or a concept that is complicated or riddled with change. It also means that you end up with very, very long lead times. So being able to change your direction becomes immensely difficult. And it stifles innovation. Someone sitting at one of these is not going to feel particularly innovative when all they do is bolt on something every single day, day in, day out. So for the time, that thinking was great. But now, uh, uh, when we're solving the types of problems we're solving in this world, that type of, it, of management approach just does no longer work. So your business becomes predictable. We know what's going to happen. So let, let, me, let me ask you, just, uh, uh, and I'm after feedback from people here, how well do you think this, this type of approach will work with the businesses that you're operating now? Can you work like that? Can you line everything up and then just run it and hope like hell nothing changes? Doesn't work, right? Think around uh, the military. There's a whole series of, uh, a whole um, area of science called complex adaptive systems that is, help, that's, that is helping completely reshape management thinking. In warfare, predictability equals death. The consequences are utterly severe. In business, it's not that dissimilar. So this guy called John Boyd invented um, a concept that for those of you that have met my colleague Bruce Keatley would, would know well, uh, that Bruce studied in, when he was in the, the military called the OODA loop. And it stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. And it's the foundational backbone for military strategy. And it's based on Deming's cycle. So constantly learning and adapting. Um, Bruce's classic joke for, um, for that the rest of the world cracks about America is America's version of the OODA loop is observe, overreact, destroy, and apologize. <laughs> so. But the, the, the concepts are, are quite powerful. There's the basic drills to be able to teach people how to do the bits that they need to do. And then s simply, he with the tightest OODA loop, i.e. the fastest cycle with feedback back into what they're doing, wins. They outmaneuver the competitor. 
So Bruce used this in teaching fighter pilots how to be the most manoeuvrable and how to outmaneuver a much more powerful machine than the one you've got, i.e. how to start with a, with, uh, work with an enemy who's got a major advantage and to outmaneuver them just simply by having an adaptive system that allows you to be more manoeuvrable. And Jack Welsh is classic for this quote, that if you're not moving at the speed of the marketplace, you're already dead. It's just that you haven't stopped breathing. You've got to be able to constantly change, particularly in, 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 um, in this modern day. So how resilient are you? How resilient is your business to a, sh to a shock? How many people in the room have read a book, Anti-Fragile? Has anyone heard of it, read it? I'd strongly encourage you to have a read of it. He talks about three different types of, um, of businesses or, or situations. A fragile business has a very, very low tolerance to, um, to problems or to disruption. And by definition, if something comes along like that and shakes it, a small change can have massive consequences. And the classic is an egg, it's broken, it's no good now. The next type of business is a robust business. So a business that basically, it doesn't care about disruption because it's so strong that nothing can actually hurt it. However, it also doesn't capitalize on the constantly changing landscape. It's just completely ignorant and sails straight through it regardless. And the most powerful type of business of all, or this type of system, is what he calls an anti-fragile system, because there is no word in the English language, or any language for that matter, that, that means anti-fragile. But it's a system that's actually shaped by and thrives on disruption. So think of the earth. Doesn't matter what we do to it, we'll wipe ourselves out. It'll continue on, it'll just adapt and change back to the way it's always been, just like it did when the dinosaurs died out or any other major event. It's a self-correcting system that is well and truly beyond resilient. So one of the exercises we do um, when we're looking at business agility is scenario planning. So we'd sit down and look at a, a, and get um, executives to plan out a bunch of events that, that could possibly happen to them over a time period, and we, we end up looking something a bit like this. If we've got an impact over on the y-axis and time here on the x, let's just assume that your business is going to continue on with a reasonably steady growth rate, um, maybe at, at inflation or better, and then start mapping out some good things that could happen. So, you know, maybe we get a partnership with Salesforce. Maybe uh, we enter the Chinese market, and that's really, really positive for us. Maybe uh, we're the first one to market with Acme Cloud integration. And the level of, of impact is great, and the time frame shorter here, longer time frames out here. So we're talking the sort of, you know, typically the three to 10 year type time frames. Or what about some negative things that happen? What say there's a sudden spike in exchange rates, and that hurts us? What say the European financial markets collapse? What's that gonna mean to us? Severe. What say Googling to the market? You imagine if you were wise as maps five years ago. You're gone if Google enters the market, it's over and out. So the question is, if these events happened now, how maneuverable are you? How quickly could you turn your business to be able to deal with one of those shocks? And the answer for most of the people I talk to is we're not. And that's a problem. That's a huge problem. So here's the type of discussion that I'm often having with CEOs at the moment around this, is are you maneuverable enough now when we go through these scenarios? And normally after getting them through an exercise, we take about half an hour, map out those scenarios and just guess on the board where they might go with the executive team and we'll say, are you maneuverable enough now? If one of these happen, say, you know, God forbid this happens, or there's a sudden opportunity in front of you and you can do this, how maneuverable are you to, to be able to change direction and seize that? And the answer most of the time is, we're not. There's no way that we could react quickly and turn on a dime. Then the question is, well, do you need to be? And they normally say, well, yes, we have to be. Our, our, our main competitors move and change constantly. We have to be able to move with the market. So then we ask some questions like, well, so is agility part of your business strategy? And normally at that point, they sort of start to rock back a little bit and go, gosh, I see where he's going with this. And the answer normally is no, but I can see now it kind of needs to be. So then we'll say, well, do you see that as a problem? 
that you can't react to this. And I'm being a bit of a smart ass here because I already know the answer. Because, well, yeah, I do see that as, as, as now, but I'd never thought of it in those terms. So then we might say, well, so historically, who did you actually put in charge of agility as an imperative at your organisation? And normally it will be IT. And I'm hoping by now that the CEO is actually getting quite a clear picture of why maybe they haven't been successful with Agile. Then I'll ask a question like, well, what's your investment in agility been to date? You've said here that it definitely need, you need to be manoeuvrable. So what have you actually, and you've said that it needs to be part of your strategy. So what have you actually do to, done to invest in it? And typically as I, I don't know. Don't know how much money we've invested. Which follows to the next question of, well, how do you go about measuring this? And normally the answer is we aren't. They've got no idea whether implementing Scrum or Agile or Kanban or any of the stuff that we've done actually impacts the bottom line. And then the next question is, well, how are you actually figuring out whether that's been worthwhile? And that's normally the answer. Not sure. Gut feel is that we need to do a hell of a lot more. But there's no system there for measuring whether they're actually becoming a more agile, responsive business. So normally, by the end of it, the picture is, well, this. This is about how manoeuvrable we are. About as manoeuvrable as an oil tanker. And if our competitors are coming in with increasingly smaller sized businesses that are adaptive, then this presents a major problem for us because we cannot turn fast enough. We see an iceberg coming and it's inevitable. So if you look at a traditional business, how it goes about thinking, look at what I was saying about Taylorism and then translate that to how most of us look about business these days. We tend to look at business like this. And it, this isn't necessarily software, this is the stages that a business will think around from an idea right the way through to market. So they'll often look and say, right, stage one, we're going to do all of this stuff. And we'll get all of that done, and once that's done, we'll do stage two. And once stage two's done, we'll tick the box, and we'll pass the phase gate, and then we'll go to stage three. And it goes on and on like this, like a relay race, passing the baton to the next person, and to the next person, and to the next person. But what if this and that is riddled with mistakes and assumptions and risk. You're baking it all the way through, right to the very, very end. So say now on time, we're at this point, and our boss says, Goldstein, how are we doing? How confident are you at that point? How confident are you that what you're developing is gonna be an absolute winner for your, for your market? that what you're doing is absolutely going to solve the business case. It's going to bring in this amount of money for that amount spent. You're probably not, right? You'll probably be more like this. I actually don't know. So then finally, when you do get the damn thing delivered, and you hand the keys over, and ta-da, we often end up with like this. Because we've baked in all these assumptions that we thought around what the customer wanted, but they actually don't. It's wrong. Or we've been too slow to market to actually validate that. How we think in an agile business is fundamentally different. We'll look at it this way, so time will go across ways rather than vertically. And we might look at this and say, well, let's just do five things. Let's break it into small pieces and we'll just get five things completely done. So that when he comes in here and says, Goldstein, how are we doing? Our answer can be, well, there's five things 100% done and shipped, or ready to ship. And there's 10 things that we haven't started. We know exactly where we are with that. We're the third of the way through it. Even better, we can then package that up and we can start to look at releasing it to a customer. And say when we release it to the customer, we then get some feedback back to say, well, and they come and talk to us, to our customer and engagement people, and say, well, what we've learned is the results of that, as we watch the customer use the product, is that this isn't actually what the customer wanted. It's not quite right. We need to do something a little bit different. It's not bad for a first effort, but we've got an opportunity to improve it. So what do we do? We go again, and we do another release. And this time, she's like, wow, that's great. They love that. It gave them something that they really wanted and they had the opportunity to put feedback into it. But if we could also just do this other little bit here, that our competitors don't have that. 
that would blow the market away. So kaboom, we do it again. And that's, then it's like awesome, that's given them something that has given us deep competitive advantage. But probably even better is guess what? We don't need the rest of that crap because the customer doesn't care. There are assumptions that we thought mattered to the customer but don't. And we can only get that if we bind our customers into our product development cycle. She can cancel that project now. And this, this type of approach is happening all over the world. The statistics show us that two-thirds of the features we build in software products, the customer never uses. So why make them? So think around how agile this type of company is, which is how most of them are. I start with a large upfront plan. Now do all this, the, 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 the business thinking will be very waterfall type driven. We will do a big upfront plan, loads and loads of requirements, write all this stuff down, put it in folders, do all this research and analyze and analyze and analyze business cases. We, 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 we don't want to be able to change. We've got this belief that if we just get everything nailed up front, then we'll be right. We create a culture where mistakes are not welcome, we're no stuff ups type culture. And we don't, we don't ever want to challenge that culture. It's just, just follow what's, what you're told to do. And what we put out is a batch. We put out a nice big batch of documents under the belief that if we follow all of this as a business, our great idea is going to be a winner. And then often in businesses, the ones that are delivering with Scrum deliver iteratively. iteratively. So, you know, that, that we go to the delivery phase and these increments, we build value and value and value and we deliver and we deliver. And then over here in operations, when we go to get it live, these guys are stuck in waterfall thinking as well. So they've got a culture that minimalizes change in operations. They do, it's break fix. They're very, very scared about anything coming into production. But they've got lots and lots of checklists. IT is used as a cost center rather than something that adds value. And we use these rigid processes to try and slow down the rate of change. And so it processes in batches. And meanwhile, our customer's sitting here like this, and the batch comes over, and finally the customer receives it, and they look like this. That's not an agile business. It's a business that's using agile for this bit here. We call this affectionately the scrum sandwich. It's scrum sandwiched by waterfall either side. So if you contrast that to this company, a company that starts out with just a vision, it's got some concepts. Doesn't know whether they're right or not. It's got, it accepts that there's some ambiguity. It's not entirely sure. Doesn't even know sometimes who the customer is. Um, but they are really, really focused on, on engaging and having systems that connect with that customer. They're quite happy to work off a VC incremental budget um, model. They get a bit of money, they go out, they do a few iterations, and if it proves itself, it gets more. And they've got a culture where it's fine to fail. As a matter of fact, it's all about failing fast. If you're going to fail, fail fast and hard. And what they'll do is they'll say, right, let's create an experiment. Rather than go out and assume our business case and our plan is actually correct, let's just run a little experiment and go and actually get that into the hands of the customer and validate that this is actually what we think is going to add value. We use Scrum to deliver it. And... Using, continue, using quality infrastructure and automation, we can get flow through to the customer. We can measure what the customer actually thinks of it. And we use this system called validated learning where we take that data and we feed it back in and make empirical decisions, not guesses. And we go again. And again. Each time, focusing on this creating information from which we can learn and reduce risk. That's an agile business. That's what an agile business looks like. For those of you that have ever studied lean, you'd know that big batches and high utilization are the enemy of that. So here with the yellow, with the larger batches, and as utilization goes up, our ability to put things through the system radically declines. So the amount of time to go through the system shoots up. Large batches all at once, with people heavily utilised, is the enemy of, this, of, a, of a quick cycle. 
Notice here why relay racing um, thinking has killed us, because it's all around large batches and trying to utilise everyone all the time. So in an agile business, everything changes, and I mean everything. How we think around business cases and funding, how the business and IT actually work together, it's a focus of flow through the system into the hands of the customer. How we do sales and marketing. The sales guys are critical because they're a touch point with the customer to give us information. How we do governance, how we report, how we manage people, all of that changes. So what Agility Path is, is essentially using these techniques to help to use Agile to help a business become manoeuvrable. So we create a backlog of all the things the business needs to change, and we go out with an executive team taking practices out of that backlog and delivering increments of change to turn a business into one of those highly manoeuvrable, adaptive businesses. So it's a framework. Um, and this is where a lot of the, the focus in the Agile world's going on now, is how do we use this stuff like Scrum and like Agile and like Kanban to make very, very agile and manoeuvrable businesses. And we constantly measure. We measure things like revenue per employee, customer satisfaction, staff satisfaction, innovation rate, time to market, all of those types of things to figure out, are we actually becoming a more agile business for the investment that we've made? And I want to wrap up with this, this quote here from um, Steve Denning saying if there was a Nobel, Nobel Prize for management, it should go to Ken Schwaber and, and Jeff Sutherland for their contribution to Scrum. And I think that's how, how much the management world is starting to wake up to how these concepts like Scrum, married with lean startup, married with design type thinking, are becoming so powerful for the industry, for the product development industry. Come and talk to me. Come and say hi, I'm here for the length of the conference. Yes, that is me the world's largest Oompa Loompa. Um, the photo went viral, someone flogged it off my Facebook page and made one of those motivational posters that said Oompa Loompas, we've found their leader. Um, come and say hi, I'm here for the rest of the conference. If you're interested in, in the trend in business agility and maneuverability, um, come and say good day. work in the agile process when you've got uh, customers that might not be agile? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I mean, to me, it's, it's about discussion and education. And it's not about trying to push a concept to them and say, you know, you need to change or you need to do this. Often it's moving it to, to business type language that they can relate to. So things like, what would it mean to you if we could get a smaller version of this into your hands within a month? Would, is that something that would be useful for you? And just ask them. And they might come back and say, well, yeah, that means that we could actually show such and such and get some feedback. And so and there's, a, there's a great book Ken Schwaber wrote called Software in 30 Days, which was designed for managers to, it, it's written in language that, you know, no, no disrespect to managers, but it's written in language that a 10 year old can read. It's trying to remove all the techno babble from Agile, just to say, here's the business case for Agile. This is what it means, and here's how you could use it. So it's just things like that. Would, it, would you be able to use this if we could put it into your hands you know, in smaller chunks more regularly? Great. Thank you.